Hello my friends and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 build guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're going to cover my pick for the best monk build in Baldur's Gate. As part of my basic builds series, the goal here is to create a powerful build that works out of the box, requiring no specific items and using no exploits, that showcases the power of the monk class as much as possible while also taking the majority of its levels in Monk. Luckily, that's something that we really want to do because Monks power up significantly as you put more levels into them. According to the stats that Larian just released, Monk is the second least picked character class, which is funny because I think in a vacuum it's actually the single strongest class in Baldur's Gate because it gets access to no resource disables in the form of Stunning Strike, or very low resource rather, you need to spend a key point on it, but Stunning Strike Taking away an enemy's whole turn while continuing to do solid, consistent damage is an incredibly powerful effect, and it costs you very few resources to use. Not to mention that monks are also just one of the best DPS classes in the game out of the box. So you're going to end up with an incredibly powerful character that will be very viable for honor mode or, of course, any lower difficulty settings. I'm using Lazelle here as the example character, both because it fits with her being a Githyanki, just in terms of flavor, but also because Githyanki, I think, are in the top two or three races for monks, having access to the Githyanki's racial misty step is extremely strong for monks. Any additional teleportation or mobility on this already mobility-focused class makes you able to solve priority problems across the battlefield very, very easily, and since you will end up doing so much damage that you can bring pretty much en any enemy from full to zero in a single round, getting right next to them is very useful. Other races to consider are Dwergar for the invisibility and enlarge, both of which are extremely strong for monks, as well as Wood Elf, because this is a mobility-focused class, so the classic additional move speed from Wood Elf is very valuable for you as well. All right, let's get into it and start building this monk. So the first thing that I have to address is probably the elephant in the room for monks, which is that they are the class, the single class that benefits the most from abusing strength elixirs. If you're not aware, there is very early on in the game, a trader that will sell you these elixirs of hill giant strength that will set your strength to 20. And because monks are so multi-attribute dependent or mad, they're the, the maddest character class in the game, um, that can enable you to take a much cleaner and better stat spread on the character, and that will power up your character significantly if you drink a strength elixir every day. We're not going to do that in this build, because I find it one, like I said, this build is designed to work with no specific items, and two, I find it aesthetically a little ugly that your powerful warrior has to rely on, on steroids every day in order to actually power up. But if you want to do that, then that will power up your build, so it's definitely worth mentioning right here off the beginning. To set up our stat spread, we have to take into account that multi-attribute dependency, because monks need strength to deal damage. This is very important even though you get dexterity-based unarmed attacks, because the most powerful damage combo for monks that we'll see later on in the game relies on having a strength score, a high strength score. You need dexterity for armor class and initiative. You need constitution, of course, for hit points. And because you are a melee character, it's really important that we get decent constitution and have decent hit points. And you'll also end up with lower AC than most other characters because despite having unarmored defense, which allows you to gain additional armor while armor class while not wearing armor, you're still going to end up with lower armor value than characters that are wearing armor or have shields or anything along those lines. And you also need wisdom because that's the source of your unarmored defense and also the source of a lot of your scaling in terms of your class abilities. So that's four attributes that we need very high and we'd like to max out at least one of them. So that means that our stats are very heavily uh, stretched in terms of what we're trying to do. For that reason, we're going to have to make a couple sacrifices unless, as I talked about, you do the Strength Elixir build. I'll show you a stat array that works for each of those builds. The one that we are going to go with here is 17 Strength to start with, and you'll see why we're taking the odd number as we go. Only 12 dexterity, which is extremely low for one of my builds, but unfortunately we do have to make sacrifices because we require 
uh, our stats to be so high in certain areas. And we will do some, some things to mitigate this low dexterity, the low initiative that that brings, and so on as we go. 14 constitution, that's just the minimum that we can possibly get away with. 14 wisdom, because it's very important that we have high wisdom. This increases our AC and will also be very useful for damage and so on later on. And then with our remaining two points, unfortunately, there's not much that we can do that's useful here. So we're going to put them in intelligence, because that's the of intelligence and charisma, the more important of the two saving throws. You'll notice that this is a very poor stat spread, and that is one of the balancing factors for monks. Monks require lots of different stats, and in return for that, they get to just be an extremely strong character. I'll talk about sort of what makes them so powerful as we go. If you are going to use strength elixirs, then you can take only eight strength, and that lets you save a lot of points, obviously, um, which you can then put elsewhere. So that will let you get 16 dexterity, 15 constitution. Again, I will talk about why that is later on. Um, still 10 intelligence and 16 wisdom. This is a much cleaner stat spread that gives you access to all three of the stats that you really want, but requires you to drink an elixir every day. You could also even take 17 wisdom if you uh, reverse these. Um, to get 16 dexterity and 17 wisdom, and plan on taking anti ethel's deal to bring your wisdom to 18, which will save you a feat later on. That will be even better, uh, but of course isn't 100% reliable on honor mode because you might accidentally kill her or fail the dialogue checks required to do that. All right, so I did have to talk a lot about the character's stat spread, but for monks, it's really important that you kind of get the, the stat spread set up the way that it should be because monks are so attribute reliant. So let's bring this back to our 17, 12, 14, 8, 14, or 14, 10, 14, 8, and talk a little bit about the monk's class features and why it's so still so good to pick this character class, even though it requires you to take this odd stat spread. And the reason is basically this ability right here, Flurry of Bo Blows. For a bonus action, you get to attack twice with your offhand, which is incredibly strong. Um, and this will scale with either your strength or dexterity, whichever is higher. Um, Although the tooltip here is broken, you can see it shows 1d4 plus 1. This will be 1d4 plus 3, just so you know that for whatever reason, the tooltip in the level up screen is, is broken. Um, and something that I talk about a lot in a lot of my builds is that very few characters get access to multiple attacks before level 5, while monks not only get two attacks at level 1, they get three attacks at level 1, tripling the number of attacks that almost every other character can make at level 1. They also get to add their attribute bonus to all of these attacks. So unlike a character that just is holding two weapons, these are fully featured attacks. The base damage die is lower because they're only 1d4 as opposed to like the 1d10 of a longsword or something like that. But making three attacks and adding your strength to each of them means that already you outpace every other character in terms of damage starting at level one. And it only gets better from here. You also get uh, just normally an extra attack whenever you make an attack with a monk weapon or a normal attack. Um, at level one also, it's probably worth using a weapon, though later on you're going to want to switch to purely unarmed, with one exception that I'll talk about at the end of the game, or at the end of the video when I go into itemization. Um, Additionally, you get unarmored defense, allowing you to add your wisdom to your armor class. So we'll have 13 AC starting at level 1, which is not great, um, given that we only have 12 dexterity and 14 wisdom. So any additional boosts to our AC that we can get, like the bracers of defense that give you AC while you're unarmored, or a ring of protection, or a cloak of uh, protection, are going to be extremely valuable for monks because having low armor class and being a melee character is pretty dangerous. Again, you mitigate this somewhat if you're willing to do the elixir abuse. So that there are a lot of good reasons to do that. All right, let's get into leveling up and we're going to level our character. At monk level two, you don't have to make any decisions, but you do get additional movement speed while you're not wearing armor. Um, this is very powerful, obviously. I've talked 
extensively about how good movement speed is, but remember that Monk's basic sort of play pattern is going to be picking a priority target, running to it, beating the crap out of them in one turn, and then leaving. And the more movement speed you have, the less it matters that you're going to have relatively low hit points and relatively low AC, because you can just get out of range of the other enemies in the engagement if you move in, hit an enemy a few times, and then just run away. You also get a few bonus actions, and these are all pretty useful. Patient defense gives attackers disadvantage, which can be used to mitigate somewhat your low AC. Um, at Step of the Wind, doubles your movement speed for a bonus action. This does come at the cost of multiple attacks, but if you just really need to leave an area, this is good. It's also especially valuable on Honor Mode, where sometimes just running away from a combat is the best thing that you can be doing. So having Step of the Wind making that easier is really nice. And Disengage lets you do this uh, safely. Um, this is the same as the rogue feature. Basically, you spend a bonus action to disengage and not take an opportunity attack. This is useful, but less useful than the other two. Most of the time, it's better to take the opportunity attack and then just get further away, thanks to using Step of the Wind, than it is to spend your bonus action on disengaging. Um, and the reason for that is that you then... If you just disengage and just move away, the enemy may be able to just follow you and attack you again. Whereas if you double move away, they, they will almost certainly not be able to get in range for a second attack. So it's often better to just take the opportunity attack and deny them future attacks. You gain more control over the battlefield by doing that. Every level you also get an additional key point, which is additional times per day, that you can whack enemies more times. At Monk level 3, we again have to make a very important decision, which is what subclass we're going to take. And of the three subclasses, one thing that's kind of nice about Monks is all three of these are really good. But for the most powerful and sort of most efficient subclass, we're going to go with the Way of the Open Hand. This gives you both control and damage, which are extremely strong. So you get Flurry of Blows Topple, for example, which is basically the same as the Battlemaster trip attack maneuver, but with two unarmed attacks instead of a normal attack, um, which is tons of damage as well as knocking the enemy prone, setting up future attacks in that round for advantage, as well as uh, sometimes preventing enemies from taking turns under certain circumstances. You can also get Stagger, which can prevent reactions. This is especially good against enemies that you know have Counterspell. You can stagger them and then get a Counterspell off. <clears throat> or rather, get a spell off without fear of it being Counterspelled. And then also you get Flurry of Blows Push, allowing you to shove an enemy away. So basically you get two of the best Battlemaster maneuvers from Way of the Open Hand. And then of course you're going to get more excellent class features as you continue to level up. At Monk level 4, we get our first feat, and this is why we took an odd number in strength. We also get Slow Fall, which mostly doesn't matter, although is, I suppose, a reasonable option in combat. You can jump off of high surfaces without uh, and take less damage. Um, useful because you'll have lower hit points. And something to keep in mind is that monks are essentially melee glass cannons. They're very, very squishy, even if you have the Strength Elixir build that has a little more HP. Um, so you need to be quite careful with where you position your monk. Things like jumping off of a high surface and taking some damage that another character would ignore, the monk is actually sometimes at risk from. All right, we are going to take, for our first feat, Tavern Brawler. It says when you make an unarmed attack on it, and we are going to be making only unarmed attacks, but more importantly, we double our strength modifier to attack and damage rolls, which is why we increased our strength, and we get to boost our strength up to 18 from the one point from Tavern Brawler. If you're the Strength Elixir build, then you would have taken 15 Constitution and would go up to 16 Con from this. This is incredibly powerful. One, because we're doing this at mid currently three times per turn, and that's with no additional you know, haste or anything like that. Um, no additional sources of attacks from any other party members or anything, meaning that we're going to be applying our 18 strength three times every turn. And even more importantly, we 
double are to hit chance, meaning that you are extremely likely to hit. This is allows you to uh, break what's called bounded accuracy, which is the concept in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition that your to hit chance will never be too high or too low, essentially. Um, it tries to keep your hit chance constrained within a fairly narrow band against on-level enemies in order to make combat exciting where you'll miss uh, almost as often as you hit. When we are doubling our to hit modifier from strength, we're breaking that constraint, and this character is going to hit way out of both much harder and way out of scale in terms of number of hits that for other enemies, which is why we're the best damage dealing class in the game from sort of a basic character sense. And you do this with almost no resources already. At monk level 5, it gets even better because you get extra attack, so now you're attacking four times per round with your main hand. Um, you also, if you're a Gith Yankee, get access to Misty Step. This does mean you're trading two attacks, because every time you use your bonus action on something that isn't Flurry of Blows, you're giving up two attacks, which at this level is going to be uh, your... Each of these attacks adds plus eight to your strength, so each of these attacks adds plus eight to damage from your strength. So it's really important to bear in mind how much damage you're giving up every time you use your bonus action for something that's not Flurry of Blows. But having the option to do this is very important. You also get access to one of the best abilities in the game, Stunning Strike, which causes an enemy to make a saving throw or be stunned. In Tabletop, the save DC is based on your wisdom, but oddly enough in, in Baldur's Gate currently, uh, as of the date of recording, the save DC is based on your strength or dexterity, whichever is higher, meaning that you are going to have your stunning strikes go off much more often, even though we took lower wisdom. Uh, so that's another thing that's really powerful about this character. And this just stops the enemy from acting for a turn, which is unbelievably strong. Um, trading one... It's not even your whole action, it's trading one attack action for an entire enemy's turn, which is... an incredible action efficiency, way better than just about any other way of disabling enemies, and the only thing it takes is a key point, so it's basically resourceless, because key points are very cheap. You get a ton of them, you get another one every time you level up. At monk level 6, we get the other thing that makes Way of the Open Hand monk so good. In fact, two things that make Way of the hand, Open Hand monk really good. Um, all monks get magic attacks, meaning that they ignore resistance to, uh, against unmagical damage, against non-magical damage, which is really useful in a few fights. There's there's some that where enemies just have resistance to all non-magical damage, so getting the key empowered strikes is very valuable. You also get even faster, so you'll be even more mobile as you go across the battlefield, which is very useful. And you get the manifestation subclass, which lets you add a d4 plus your wisdom modifier to every one of your attacks. Well, we're attacking four times around, so that's going to be our, whatever our wisdom modifier is, currently only two, plus four d4. Uh, so this is an additional 4d4 plus eight damage every round. Um, and that's again without any additional sources of attacks, like haste from a party member. You also get uh, wholeness of body, which lets you recharge key points and have an extra bonus action when you are in the wholeness effect. This does take your action, but remember, every bonus action you have is another flurry of blows. So this can let you spend this uh, feature to gain six attacks every round, multiplying the double damage from your tavern brawler, multiplying the damage from your whole from your manifestations, even more. Also important with these manifestations, you can only have one active at a time, but you can always inspect your enemies, and you can switch freely between them to see if there's a damage they're weak to, if they're resistant to one of these damage types, and swap which damage you're using appropriate to the enemy you're attacking. At monk level 7, we get Evasion, which is less good for this version of the the monk because of the Tavern Brawler monk, because our dexterity is a little lower, so we do have a weaker dexterity saving throw, but it's still nice. It prevents you from taking damage, and you also get Stillness of Mind, which is lets you remove two of the most common wisdom-affecting 
effects. Two of the most common ways for you to lose your turn are charmed or frightened. So this is really good. It, it prevents you from uh, suffering from some of the most debilitating effects in the game. It's just a really powerful defensive tool. And especially because monks are so squishy, getting stunned is very bad for them, so removing Charmed and Frightened is quite valuable. At monk level 8, we get another feat. And so here I'm actually going to suggest something a little odd, and that is because we have low initiative, we should take, rather than increasing our, our strength to 20 to boost our damage, we're actually going to take the alert feat. Because monks are like I said, glass cannons, whose main role in a fight is to pick an enemy and just annihilate them before they get to take a turn um, in a single round. Having alert and getting to go first means that you are able to do that much, much more reliably, and the fact that you are relatively low HP, relatively low AC, is much less important for alert, uh, for, for the monk. If you have the Strength Elixir version of the build, this is still very good, although less important. You could consider just increasing your Wisdom at this level, um, which would be 16, remember, because the Strength Elixir version gets better stats. But I think Alert is really, really valuable for monks and worth considering on every character, especially for Honor Mode, but especially for a character like this that's designed around burst damage. Next up we have a choice. We can either continue in Monk, or we can try to gain the benefits of another class. Monk continues to get good stuff as you level it up, but I think for one specific reason, there's another class that will give us some more power as we continue to go, so I'm going to recommend that at level 9, you take a dip into Rogue. This might look a little odd at first, because there's a lot of things that Rogue gets that you can't really use on Monk. For example, sneak attack can only apply to weapon damage. Since we're making unarmed attacks, we won't get sneak attack. And monks are not going to often be the uh, skill users of the party, so the expertises are not incredible. Although, of course, gaining access to stealth and putting, stealth, putting expertise into stealth does give you a lot of extra options in combat. Even with relatively low dexterity, plus 7 stealth is pretty good. And because monks want to start off every fight, it's very important to have good stealth. Athletics expertise, which also is one of the most important skills, excuse me, skills to have access to, is really good because pushing and shoving enemies is one of the best things you can do. Since you're so mobile, you can really help reposition enemies around the battlefield using your athletics. So athletics expertise is still very good. Something along these lines is kind of what I would suggest for skills. However, there's one thing that makes it really worth it to get into Rogue. Um, we already get most of these effects, but at level 3 Rogue, we can take the Thief Rogue subclass, giving us an extra bonus action. Monks have so many great uses for bonus actions, and of course the best use typically is just going to be a second or even third, depending on your... Um, the way that you have structured your turns, or whether you've used Wholeness of Body, Flurry of Blows, meaning that you, on a default turn where you spend two key points, will now be able to make six attacks in a round, up to eight, up to maybe even ten if you have an Elixir of Bloodlust, or twelve if you have an Elixir of Bloodlust and Haste, um, even more than that if you are not on Honor Mode, because, uh, or sorry, uh, 9 if you have an Elixir of Bloodlust, or 10 if with an Elixir of Bloodlust or Haste, up to 12 if you are on Tactician or below, where you gain the benefits of extra attack on those Hasted actions. But in Honor Mode, 10 attacks, each of which is applying your Wisdom, plus twice your Strength, plus whatever other bonuses you have, is going to be enough damage to one-shot pretty much every enemy. And for the very few that you can't, you can spend a few charges of Stunning Strike, Stunning Strike is also one of the best ways to burn through enemy legendary resistances, so you can make sh certain that you are going to stun these enemies, uh, even the most powerful bosses in the game. The only enemies that are immune to only enemies that are completely immune to stun are going to be able to avoid just getting stunned by you, locked down, never get to take a turn, and just have uh, the tar beaten out of them as soon as you get access to them, which you will be able to do very easily thanks to the incredible mobility of monks. 
finally, for our last level, we simply just take a fourth level in Rogue to get access to a feat and increase our strength to 20. Um, again, if you are not... If you're using the Strength Elixir build and don't need to put these points into Strength, you can put them into Wisdom to increase your AC as well as your damage from your Manifestation of Mind, etc. Um, but since the ver this version of the build is based on not using Elixirs, we're going to want to max out our, ta our Strength as quickly as we can to maximize Tavern Brawler. In terms of items, um, Monks... Pretty much all of the items that monks can use say that they can use them on them. So, for example, uh, anything that increases your unarmed strike damage, such as the Gloves of Cinder and Sizzle here, are going to be very, very good for monks. Anything that increases your AC not in armor, like a Cloak of Deflection, uh, let me, I think I've got that one here, yeah, the Cloak of Protection increases your armor class and saves by one and isn't armor. Um, a good armor piece a good armor set is the cat's grace armor which just increases your dexterity by two and any points and stats you can get you're very hungry for so that's very much worth doing um if you are lazel specifically these boots of uh or no sorry the, not the boots of psionic movement um the disintegrating night walkers are very good if you are uh, especially if you're not a Githyanki, giving you access to Misty Step. Every character should have access to Misty Step. And even though you're not a Barbarian, Brutal Leap from the Bone Spike boots with your very high strength is going to be a decent way to knock enemies prone and deal uh, damage. It does require your bonus action, but your jump distances should be incredible. So the Bone Spike boots are very good for you as well. For a typical combat turn, um, just make sure first off that you have your manifestations on, and then you're just going to pick an enemy that you want dead and just beat the absolute stuffing out of them. So let's just take a quick look in turn-based mode at what that will look like. So you are going to make a flurry of blows attack, uh, flurry of blows attack, with or without one of these bonus effects. So for example, flurry of blows topple. That's two attacks, and another Flurry of Blows topple, each of which is hitting for uh, each of those two attacks, hitting for a d6, plus 10, plus a d4, plus 2, um, plus any additional bonuses that you might have from gear or anything else from an ally. Then you can make two Stunning Strikes as an attack, making sure that an enemy will be stunned, and that only costs your four of your nine available key points, which recharge on a short rest. If you've pre-buffed with wholeness of body, you can make an additional set of attacks. So overall, you're going to average um, something like 150 or 200 damage in a round before you add any other bonuses, um, meaning that monks are just some of the best damage dealers in the game, and also lock down enemies incredibly easily. You have excellent mobility. You don't offer a lot of utility to your party, other than just the stunning strikes, but knocking an enemy over is very useful for that kind of thing, and obviously stunning strike is incredibly strong utility. So even though that in and of itself is the only utility you offer, it's so good that it's just incredible to have access to in a party. All right, my friends, I hope that you've enjoyed this look at the monk, and if you have, definitely please take the time to leave a comment, like the video, both of those things help a ton with the algorithm, and you can subscribe to my channel for more Baldur's Gate 3 character guides, Baldur's Gate 3 content, and other strategy game videos as we go forwards. Cheers, my friends. I'll catch you next time.